This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London, with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Hayley James, a Pensions Policy Institute and ESRC-sponsored PhD student in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. Hayley, we're going to talk about pensions and auto-enrolment. What do we mean by auto-enrolment here? So auto-enrolment is a policy that was implemented by the government and it basically means that employers are obligated to automatically enrol their workers, their employees, into a pension scheme. Why was that brought in? The main reason was that people weren't saving enough in terms of pensions. So in the kind of 80s and 90s, the number of people who were participating in a pension scheme and the amount of money that people were contributing into those pension schemes was really reducing. So it got to a point where the government realised that there was going to be a challenge around you know, the provision of incomes for people's retirement age. So the government was highly motivated to come up with a solution that allowed people to save enough to live reasonably well in old age. Auto-enrolment, though, doesn't give people a choice about what they do. They are automatically enrolled. So I think the thing about auto-enrolment, it wasn't just about allowing them to save. It was about actually encouraging people to save. So people have always been allowed to save what they wanted, but just allowing them to do that wasn't enough of a motivation. So auto-enrolment was about really nudging people into actually doing the saving. So nudge is this term particularly associated with Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. The idea that people aren't completely rational in the decisions they make for themselves and are often led astray by things which are irrelevant. So structure the world so that they don't make those sorts of reasoning errors and they will end up in a better place. Yeah, so it's about encouraging them to make the right decision. So the nudge theory says that people are fundamentally rational but flawed in terms of how we process the choices available to us so that by offering choices in a certain format say we can encourage people to make the right decision so hence nudge them into the right decision so that's what auto enrolment was about people weren't making the right decision of saving for their pensions so it was about offering them the choice in a way that meant they were more likely to take up that choice. What's interesting here is that the nudge is a kind of compulsory push it's not exactly a nudge in the right direction it's actually a forceful shove yeah yeah so I guess you could say the terms of nudge have been changed slightly because it is obligatory you do have an option to opt out so if you are an employee who's auto enrolled you can opt out at any point from the pension scheme but it kind of relies on that most people, when it comes to making decisions or doing something, are quite inert. So there's a theory of inertia that says people are more inclined to do nothing than do something. So once you're auto-enrolled in, you're less likely to opt out than you would be than if you were asked to opt in to start with. And a similar sort of reasoning has been used in relation to organ donation. If you make the assumption that everybody, if they don't opt out, is prepared to donate their organs in the event of an accident or whatever... The result is you get more organ donation. If you give people the choice to opt in, then they have to make an effort to actually do it. And then there are fewer organs. So better to structure society on an opt-out version. Yeah. I mean, lots of studies have shown how good it's been in terms of getting people into things like organ donation. I think it's been used in some health measures as well, kind of screening processes where you don't opt in, you kind of opt out. The difficult thing with pensions and auto-enrolment is that it's not just about that one-off decision. So with organ donation, once you're in, you're in the system, and that's done. With auto-enrolment, you kind of get pushed into it, but then it's not enough to just be in the pension system. Why not? If you are auto-enrolled, you're at a minimum level of contribution, which totals 8%, and that is not going to be enough over the course of your lifetime to provide for like an adequate pension when you get to retirement age that eight percent is made up of your employee and employer contribution that's the minimum level but if you just pay on that it's not going to generate enough no it's not going to be an adequate retirement so that that nudge wouldn't actually save you it wouldn't get you very far i mean something's better than nothing right so if you save all your life eight percent you still have something but it's not going to provide for an for a very sufficient retirement then 
So what do you think the government's expecting to happen then? What's the assumption that's being made there about this nudge? Because they must have seen that the numbers don't add up. I think there's an assumption that once people start saving, they will start to see the benefit of pension saving. So, you know, by being in the system, being a participant, you start to receive more information. You realise that actually contributing a few percent from your salary isn't too bad. And you start to become much more engaged with the whole process. So I think there's still this kind of idea that, you know, once you're in, you'll kind of see the rational benefit of saving and continue with it. So it's almost a, a contradiction. You're saying that people aren't completely rational, so they have to be shoved in this direction with the auto enrolment. But once they're auto enrolled, they'll suddenly become rational again and see that it's good for them and make a huge donation and have a very substantial pension. So I know that the government's spoken about things like the culture of saving. So by getting in, we're developing more of a culture of saving. But I do think there's this, still this discrepancy between, you know, people are irrational, need a push, versus actually, you know, once you're in, you need to keep saving anyway. So I suppose it's an empirical question that's yet to be demonstrated whether or not people will increase their pension contributions in that system, given that it's a relatively new policy. Yeah, so in the UK there's not much evidence yet. Um, I mean, the initial findings from auto-enrolment is that the number of participants has jumped significantly, but most of them are making contributions at the minimum. So average saving in pensions has come down since the introduction of auto-enrolment. There are other countries, so the US, for example, they don't have auto-enrolment at a, a national level, but and individual companies are able to implement it as an into 401k plans, which are like the equivalent of a pension. And some of the evidence there shows that auto enrolment actually anchors people to a lower amount of saving. So in the long run, people actually end up saving less overall than they would have had there not been the auto enrolment mechanism to start with. I can see that because there's a kind of learned helplessness. So if somebody else takes over your pension plan for you automatically, you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to worry because somebody's taking the money out for you without you being involved in the process. Yeah, that, I think that's definitely a danger of auto enrolment that people then just think, oh, I've, it's sorted now. I've been told what to do and I'm doing it. I don't need to do anything more. Now, you're studying this as a sociologist. It's not that you're devising pension plans for people. Could you say a bit about how a sociologist approaches an issue like studying pensions? I think the interesting thing is looking at why or how people make decisions about their pensions. The focus on auto-enrolment has effectively taken away the question of what, what are people's actual motivations for pension studying, because we've just started assuming that everyone's uh, you know, rational but flawed and need this nudge. So what I'm trying to do is to kind of move past that assumption and really look properly at what are people's motivations or reasons for contributing to the pension. So that could be as varied as, you know, how do people think about their future? How do people think about growing old? Down to how do people manage their money practices in the day to day as they're making contributions and having to pay for a lot of other things as well. And presumably that changes over time as well, because you ask an 18-year-old about pensions, they're likely to laugh at you and say, well, I won't even live to old age. And then you ask a 50-year-old, they're starting to get worried about it. I think at different stages of life, there's different meaning in pensions for people. So the closer you get to a pension, the more meaningful or the more important it is to you. And the less power you have to make a big impact, because pensions rely on small donations over a long time. It's very difficult in middle age and after to generate enough income to have a substantial pension. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's exactly the kind of contradiction. So I think that by better understanding the reasons or people's motivations for, for paying into a pension, maybe we could help people at a younger age realise the importance of starting at, you know, in your 20s or whatever, when it seems so foreign and so far away. And what's your methodology? What are you going to do? What's your plan? It's a study based around interviews. So I'll be talking to people who've been through the auto-enrolment process using a kind of case study approach, so within one organisation. So people who've all been through the process in, in one place. Talking to people who have either stayed in the scheme and stayed at the minimum levels, people who've stayed in the scheme but increased their contributions, and people who have opted out of the scheme and tried to understand a bit more about what was the motivation that led them to make those decisions. And how would you generalise from that? Because obviously if you have a specific company, you have a, a certain sort of group of people who've made decisions about their future, mm. is there any sense that that might apply to people in a different context? Well, yes and no. There is an issue around context because one of the things what we, we don't know really is 
to what extent does what the employer do change how the policy is interpreted? So when the government implements the auto-enrolment policy, obviously they have guidelines or rules or whatever, but the employment context and what the employer does could really change the impact it has on the employees, say. Maybe one employer could speak very encouragingly about pensions versus another who, you know, disparage it or kind of dismiss it. So there is an element of my study that wouldn't be generalizable to say other organizational contexts but I'd also like to hope that some of the things that I pick up around people's motivations or responses aren't just tied to the context of where they're employed and are actually more related to the way they think about their lives or their world around them and that would be more generalizable. It's interesting because pensions open up all these philosophical questions, sociological questions about what we value, how we think about our future, how much provision we're prepared to make now for something that many of us feel isn't really going to happen. You know, am I really going to last to the age of 85? I can't really visualise that now for myself. And and they're all clustered around this issue. It's becoming even more pertinent with the extension of life expectancy. P- people now are the first people who can expect to live until they're 90. And if you expect to retire at, in your 60s, that's almost 30 years of post-retirement age. It's a long period to have to think about and have to prepare for. So th- the, the decision is becoming much more heavily weighted in today's society. Obviously, you're an academic, you're studying this subject academically, but I could see there could be serious policy implications in what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And I am part sponsored by the Pensions Policy Institute, who are an educational charity who work on policy issues around pensions. And by working closely with them, I would really hope that my research would have some impact going forward. Hayley James, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.